did you think about uh, studying at Juilliard as an African-American cellist? Good question. Well, when I was at Juilliard, it was the late 80s, early mm. 90s, and there weren't many of us mm. back then. I've since met one, one of my best friends, Matt Swift, who's a great violinist. She was there at the time, but we didn't know each other. She's a little younger than I am. But, um, you know, it's interesting. I think I grew up so entrenched in the classical music world, mm -hmm. and I don't think I had an understanding as a teenager that racially, mm -hmm. because it was just always where I was in this white classical world. And I remember when I was at Greenwood, one of the teachers once brought to my attention that I was the only black kid there, which I had never really even made a relationship to that because it was just always where I was. I went to private school. I had a lot of black people in my life, but never in the musical world, so I never assumed I would see that there, I guess. And I never felt as particularly ostracized, but I remember I had a teacher, maybe it's also because I was four months granddaughter, I was kind of very special. Right. Like, but. Um, he pointed that out to me, and I remember being kind of mad at him at Greenwood that, like, I don't, I didn't identify racially as being different from everybody else, which may also have its own set of problems. But for sure, as a younger musician in classical music, I think for sure I identified much more with like the white girls. Like, I just that was, um, you know, who I knew musically. Um, that shifted as I got older. And I'm so excited that now there are so many young oh. black and brown string players around. And like, there's stuff I don't get called for in New York, and I'm like, what? <laughs> and then I'm like, oh my god, but there were 20 black girls playing in the string <laughs> section. Yes, do it. You know, oh. and they're like 10 years younger than I am. So when I was there, you know, I felt, it's hard to, it's hard, it's such an interesting, because I was Foyer Munn's granddaughter, or I am Foyer Munn's granddaughter, I was treated with a certain kind of reverence because of that, you know, um, that might have, um, what's the word, like my race may have transcended that mm. at, in the way that I was treated. Right. In Europe, around the Feuermann thing, it's been a nightmare, horrible, oh, yeah. most racist people I've ever encountered in music. Oh. and. Um, that was very surprising and very challenging to deal with because I was unaccustomed to it. And I'm not sure I've ever dealt with it quite right, but I'm about to the next time that thing comes around. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Um, do you feel like you've been given a lot of opportunities because of being African American? Um, or do you feel like you, you haven't actually been given enough opportunities? And, and also, if when you were younger versus now, do you feel like things have definitely changed from the 80s and 90s to where we are now? It's a good question. You know, I never had a really long career in classical music. I left classical music when I was in my late 20s as a player. So I don't know. I don't know what it would have been if I was taking auditions for big orchestras and if they were blind auditions or not. I don't, I don't know what that would have been like. Again, I think because I'm Feuermann's granddaughter, I got treated differently than maybe another black cellist at the time in the 80s and 90s may have been treated. I remember walking down the street with my mom, probably I was a teenager or even younger, and this, there was a black man walking down the street with a cello on Broadway, and she ran after, my mother was white, you know, and she ran after him, and she was like, oh my God, a black cellist, my daughter's a cello. I was horrified, I was like, oh my, probably a teenager, because I was horrified. And, um, his name is Troy, and I think he's in Baltimore. Do you know Troy Stewart, I think is his name? Sounds very familiar. I, can't I haven't seen him in 30 years or whatever, but I think he's in Baltimore teaching or okay. something like that. And he did quite well, and it'd be interesting to know from him, from that generation. Right. I don't know what his background was, how he got to the cello. Or, um, but again, I think with the organization like Sphinx and all these things, a lot of the black string players I know in New York who are older than I am, in their 60s, like Maxine Roach, Max's daughter, is a good friend of mine. She's a beautiful violist. Mm -hmm. And she was, she, she's an improviser, but I don't think she would characterize her career as having been a life of improvisation, although she really is great. Mm -hmm. um, and she had a long life doing, at the time when there was a lot of session work, Broadway work, and that whole thing. Um, and Charlie Burnham, my favorite violinist in the whole wide world, black man in his 60s in Brooklyn, born and raised Brooklyn, and plays with everybody doesn't have a background classically. Um, but they both learned in school. Like someone 
put a violin in Charlie's hand when he was in third grade or whatever in Brooklyn, and so he became a violinist. A lot of schools don't have music programs anymore, public schools in New York City at least. So when I meet people of that generation who it's like, oh, well, they didn't have any more violas, so I picked up the bass, you right. know, and now you got this great bass player in the world. So, in, and that's not to imply that if you're black, you necessarily are living in an underserved neighborhood by right. any stretch of the imagination, although that is the case for a lot of people. Um, and now that we don't have music in these schools where there are poor people, which tend to be, in the city at least, black and brown people, it's less likely that kids are going to play an instrument if they're not being given it in school. So in that sense, I think, sadly, there is a shift. So I don't know where kids are going to get proper cla Western classical instruction these days um, if they're not getting it in the school itself. Um, but I left classical music a long time ago. So I think as an improviser, I play pop music, I play in the avant-garde, I play a little bit of all over the place. Um, probably my race has served me tell you the truth, people get really excited when they see a black cellist, or they used to, and maybe it's more common now. <laughs> Hopefully but, it's more common, but yeah, I yeah, think that you is know. fantastic. So. But I would say, you know, and I actually, I said this to my, my chamber uh, group that I was coaching the other day, just down the street at Symphony Hall, uh, I, I teach at Project Step, and today, Martin Luther King Day, they're performing down the street at the Museum of Fine Arts, and they're playing for the mayor of Boston, Marty Walsh. And you know, they came off of their Christmas break and you know, they didn't practice enough. And I, I heard them last week and I, I said, well, you know, this is a great opportunity, but you don't want to go up there and play and then have someone feel like, oh, that was really good for, you know. Black kids. Black kids, right, you know. You On want, Martin Luther King Day, Yeah. oh my God. You know, it's like, if you're gonna play, you know, and you've been given this opportunity, you still have to hold yourself to a high level and not let that kind of, you know, affect how you present yourself and um, so I, I thought that was kind of interesting just to to see you can be given these opportunities but it's a matter of what you, you do rise. With them. Yeah. and that goes for anything whether it's yeah. music science you know just personal behavior right. like hold the door for somebody oh. somebody needs a seat on the train like it's just humanity really and Absolutely. then a, a self you have to have a I mean to get on stage unprepared is a horrible feeling yes. right you're relying on like the past <laughs> to, and whatever you believe in to get you through. And I've been there and it's dreadful and it feels horrible to not do your best. And it, our best, I think, is always, there's a huge range. Like I was saying to someone the other day, something that makes me really angry is mediocrity, especially in straight white men with positions of power. That's another interview. But there's like, Mediocrity is annoying, but for me, if I play Caravan and I kill those changes, what I think is great for me isn't going to be what my friend Abraham, when he plays those changes, his great is going to be something else, but right. we're both doing our best wherever Absolutely. we find ourselves in that space. So true. So, like those kids, and the story we all get told, my father told me, we all get that story, you know, if you're black, you got to be better than the best just to be considered kind of as good as the regular folks out there. So, yeah, your kids that you're teaching, I mean, they should expect that of themselves, whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. My mother always used to say, not always, but she said to me a few times, um, you have to prepare 200%. So when you get on stage, you can lose it all and still knock it out of the park. <laughs> so for sure, there are more of us out here, and it's wonderful. And I'm excited when I see more young black kids playing who are staying in the classical tradition and not doing what I did because classical music here and in Europe, they need this mm -hmm. desperately. Absolutely. And I think, in my experience is that in Europe, they're much slower to the take. I see. But um, I mean, and every school is different too. Like right. Juilliard is really old fashioned in my opinion in a lot of ways. Manhattan school is a little bit more forward thinking, or at least the way it feels mm -hmm. in the, to walk the room, the hallways, yeah. you know? So, yeah, but I, I hope there are more and more black kids playing classical yeah. music. Absolutely. Yeah.